careful, it's scary down here. Okay. Trap door. Oh, yes. So if I get too drunk, you just throw me down in there? And lock you in. Okay. As long as the beer is down there, I don't care. I can turn the taps off. Okay. Careful, it's a very low ceiling. Okay. And it's nice and chilly, so if it gets too hot in summer, you can just come down here and have a little sea. Yes. It is nice and cool here. And this is where you keep the bitters. This is where all the bitters are kept along there, although we've sold most of them through at the moment. And you said this is about 14 degrees Celsius? Yep. About Should 50, be. 52, 55 degrees? It is actually 12. 12, which is 52 degrees. Which is. 53. Yeah, they're about. So the myth of British beer being room temperature, well, I guess it's room temperature if you're in the cellar. Yeah, that's about <laughs> but right. But it's 52 degrees. Oh, yes. Is there a reason that bitters are kept at 52 degrees or that? When these ones come in, they're still uh, fermenting. They're still so, fermenting? Yeah. they got three days on here, and they've still got to drop and settle. So all the goodness, it comes through the pipe at the bottom there. That's now, is there a shelf life on bitter? Once it's been opened, you've got about three to five days to tell it through. That's it, three to five days. And is it? Otherwise, it, it just over, over filters and starts to go off. Eventually, it'll turn into vinegar. Wow. Well, this is really, really neat. And here's all the um, keg stuff. So, if I accidentally get locked down in here, this is not going to be a problem for me. You won't be able to get into them. <laughs> you'd be surprised if, I, if it's beer, you'd be surprised what I can do. They're all, it's all gassed up, all the gas right. things are on here. The gas goes through into the green. Fills up there, there's a long spike that goes all the way through there, pressurizes it, comes straight up back through here, and then through the main cooler systems out to the top bar. So it's cooled twice, once in here and then again on the way up. Well, this is really, really interesting. Now, this is where the bin yep. comes yep. in. Heavy door. Six o'clock in the morning when this beer comes in, I'll make a racket. That's when it comes in? Yeah. Wow. Leaving about a finger, finger. of head okay. on the top. Let that settle. And then you tap it off? Yeah, I'll top mine off. Yeah, okay. It's just about right. Head depends on whereabouts you are in the country. Oh, that's the way you're going to serve beer. You can stay here. Well, as long as I get to live in the cellar and get free beer. Well, I should think so. I would work out a deal then. So this looks great. Let me try it out. Might as well join you. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is good beer. Even for a British beer, that's good beer. Yeah, you watch I it. wouldn't compare it with a German beer. But, you know. <laughs> It's good beer, though. No, it is really good. It's tasty. It's got a lot of a bite to it. Mm. Now, the English bitter, that's because it's got the hops are a little stronger or what? Smoother as well. Mal yeah. Malted. Okay. And where do these hops come from? Fields. I know, but whereabouts? <laughs> Germany? Probably. Probably. Yeah. All right, I'm on the border of Wales and England, close to Welsh Pool. at a pub called the Admiral Rodney. And what I've done was I stopped and got a lunch, or they call it here dinner. And it's called the Plowman's Special. The reason they called it the Plowman's Special is because when farmers were in the field, it's something they could take to the field wouldn't have to return to the house. And so it's a pork pie, much like we call a pot pie. Pickles, onions, and if you notice the pickles, they're, uh, they're brown, because there's a little bit of a molasses base inside there. Nice piece of French bread, some cheese, and of course, a good English bitter. And I'm sitting with some good company, which maybe they'll be on TV in a minute or on the film in a minute. Maybe they won't. I don't know. But the cool thing about England is people like to converse. They love to talk. We don't have TVs blurring everywhere. So I'm really looking forward to this lunch. Well, I just finished my lunch. 
uh, dinner here in Wales, England at the Admiral Rodney. And one of the neat things about the UK is you get to sit with people a lot of times and have conversation. There's not blaring TVs, sitting by yourself. And I ran across a fellow here named Nick Griffin. He's a Welsh Englishman, which works because we're on the Welsh Indeed. English border. Yep. And um, he's going to explain a little bit about Admiral Rodney because I noticed there's several Admiral <coughs> Rodney pubs around this area. Yeah, there's a number of uh, pubs named after Admiral Rodney uh, all over the United Kingdom, actually. But this one is actually, in a way, entitled to because um, Admiral Rodney, Rodney had a genuine connection with this area. Okay. So was um, he was, well, he was um, one of the most uh, famous uh, British naval leaders of the um, 18th century. Uh, he was involved in battles against the Spanish, against the French. He um, more or less single-handedly with his uh, men stopped one of the earlier French in attempted French invasions of Britain. Okay. Uh, he was heavily involved during the American War of Independence. Um, out of something like 25 ships that your people lost, he took 15 of them. He was a tremendously effective um, admiral. Uh, and towards the end of his career, once he was no longer a fighting admiral, uh, he got involved or was um, taken on as part of the, the commissariat side, the organizational side. Uh, and he engaged in, in, got involved in a huge rebuilding of the British Navy. Okay. So of course they needed loads and loads of oak trees. And nearly all the oak trees in southern England had been felled and turned into ships and houses generations before. Uh, so he came here on the English-Welsh border and found a fantastic supply of really good oak. Uh, and they cut it down, they cut a big river, river here, the river, Se river Seven, flows all the way down to Bristol. So they cut the oak trees down here and floated them down and built a new British Navy, which was the navy that basically uh, beat Napoleon at the Battle of, uh, and, um, Battle of Trafalgar. Uh, and he made so much money for the landowners and the farmers around here that uh, when he died to commemorate it, uh, but also out of gratitude, they put a, a memorial to him. There's a, a hill over that side, you can see later on, uh, with a big pillar on top of it. And that's uh, Admiral Rodney's pillar, his memorial. So as we're about a mile from it, uh, this pub's named after him. And there's several pubs around here named Admiral Rodney. There's within several. A, within a region. Yeah, but this is the, this is the closest. This is closest. Yeah. So I, I did notice, I did detect just a little bit, they're still upset about the, the colonial war. He did, he did mention that they took 15 of our ships, but how did that war end anyway? Just, anyway, uh, we got rid of you. We, you got rid of us. You got rid of the wild blood, and we all went to America, right? That's exactly it. So that's, but um, you know, this area here is so beautiful. It's it's quaint. It's quiet. Um, what what is your main industry here? Oh, the main industry here. Heavens sheep. Above. I see a lot of sheep. <laughs> a lot of sheep. Yeah. Uh, well, it used to it used to be quarrying. This was a, a quarryman's pub here right. originally, uh, and there's still actually a big uh, aggregate quarry just down the road. Right. Um, you get lorries thundering up the other way. But no, the main industry here really is farming and there's an awful lot of tourism as well. It's a lovely place for people to come and visit. Oh, especially for the summertime. Absolutely. Especially if you're in a hot area to come up here and cool off a little bit. Of course, yeah. it's been a little warm since I've been here, like 85 degrees, which I guess is a little that's bit unusual. A hot, that's a hot day. Yeah. yeah, but it still feels really good. It feels, it's, I guess it feels good to you. This is lovely for us. Yeah. Yes, yes. So what do you think of our beer? For British beer, it's pretty good. I don't know about, uh, you know, compared against the German beer. Beer's this is the best beer in the, best the world. Beer. Best beer in the world. I don't know. There's a few people that might differ, but it is good. <laughs> it is good. It is really good. No, I'm yep. just teasing you. It is a really good beer. It has a little more flavor, a little more, well, I wouldn't say a little more flavor. It has more hardiness to it yeah. than like a, a German lager. Mm. But uh, it is good. It is good. And it's not warm, is it? Like you, no, people no, no, retained. no, 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 and you don't pay fourteen dollars a gallon for gas, <laughs> and you don't drink warm beer. It's uh, it was like 52, 55 degrees. Yeah, about that. So it's just chilled just slightly. Yeah, but it was good. It's, it's got it. I guess that brings the flavor out more instead of being thirty four degrees. Exactly. If it's too cold, you can't taste it. I think. Well, I'll tell you what. I really love your area here. I love the UK. That's why I like coming here. The fish and chips are great. Mm -hmm. The bitter's good, and the uh, company, the the people are really friendly. Yeah, indeed. I noticed you um, talking to the landlord earlier on, and uh, your puzzlement when he was telling you that um, you can't go in the kitchen. Yes, I yep. wanted to go in the kitchen <coughs> to film the uh, cook preparing the lunch, and he said I wasn't allowed in there, which is a little strange. And uh, but I found out it was because regulations that's been imposed. Mm. Yeah, but they're not British regulations. In indeed, that's that. That's the point. That um, it's health and safety. So it covers all sorts of things, but these aren't some um, rules that have been passed originally by the British Parliament, um, we're subjected to literally hundreds of thousands of different rules and regulations, some of them quite useful, 
other right. than nonsensical and really quite futile, and they all come out of the European Parliament. Um, Europe now makes about 85% of all the laws enforced in Britain. So they have to abide by the laws that are made well, have, in... Everyone in Europe is supposed to abide by the laws that are made uh, in Brussels and the European Parliament. In fact, lots of other countries have got the good sense just to ignore them. And you said but, you're part of the... But Britain imposes them. Yeah, I, I'm a member of the European Parliament okay. uh, for, for the northwest of England. Uh, so I see it at you know, close hand. And there's a, a tidal wave of legislation coming out of there week after week after week. It's quite extraordinary. As I say, some of it is well-intentioned and some of it's sensible. Right. Uh, but that well-intentioned well and sensible legislation, I believe, should be made by our own parliament. For like your own got, people. By, so, for, for our own people. Yeah, because uh, every region's have, a little different. Exactly. To have uh, Greeks and Estonians and <laughs> Latvians and so on and Spaniards making our laws. You know, I think they're, they're wonderful people, fantastic countries. But I don't want to go and make their laws for them. Uh, and I don't think that they should be making our laws for us. Well, one of the coolest things I think about Europe is the fact that you have real diversity here. And what I mean by diversity is that when I come to England, I get English fare, I get English mm -hmm. beer. When I go to Germany, I get German. When I go to France, I get good pastries. Uh, you can go to Italy, you know, of course, take your time, relax, drink some wine, eat some great food. I think that's great. So is it, does, it, does that kind of make a problem or <coughs> We have this centralized government that's making laws for different types of people. Is I, that a problem? The, the biggest problem it makes is that it makes people resent you know, Europe, and therefore they think, well, um, you know, the foreigners in these different countries or whatever, we don't like them. Don't like the French meddling with our affairs because right. it's not the French meddling with our affairs; it's French bureaucrats meddling with the affairs of France and us. Right. But um, trying to force everyone into this same mold, if it happened, if it was successful, it's going to make everyone really boring. You, know, you won't well, have this sure diversity, yeah. it'll be awful. Uh, and as I say, the most dangerous thing, I think, is the way that it makes people resent the foreigners interfering in our affairs, right. when it's not, that's not the problem at all. It's bureaucrats, it's banks, it's big business interfering with everybody, uh, and thereby setting ordinary people against each other. I think it's a huge shame and very dangerous. Well, it, it would be a shame. I mean, that's one of the reasons I come to Europe is because yeah. of the true diversity. That when I go from one region to another, I get completely different people. You get, and, and, and they're all good people that I come yeah, across, sure. but yeah. very different very different in their ways, their foods, their habits, and that's what makes it so interesting. Exactly. So this is kind of like making it all into one, yeah. which is kind of a shame. It's destroying all the, the culture and all the... Yeah. I, you, you can judge a huge amount by beer, basically. I sort of, it's all standard standards can be set by beer. Beer. Okay, yeah, I like yeah. that. Like this. If, if, if you want to know how much something really costs, uh, you know, then you have to, the best way to do it is, well, how many pints of beer? would it cost now? How many pints of beer did it used to cost? Right. So when I started uh, drinking beer, it was, which is now something like, what, nearly three pounds a pint. Right. It was 13 pence a pint. Right. So you can judge then how many hours do you have to work? Right. Or how many minutes do you have to work to buy a round, a round of drinks for three mates in a pub and yourself? Right. And that's actually a far more accurate thing. They can't lie with that statistic. Well, you know right. how, how well you are. And similarly, in terms of diversity, you know, you, every different um, brewery, the beer is completely different. Right. And the way, the way we're going in the modern world, it's like you'll end up with one set of beer right. everywhere in the world. And you've, got no, you've got no choice. Extremely it's des boring. desperately boring. Even if occasionally you get a bad pint, that's right. part of the interest, interest that you're going to get something different. I right. think that difference is something we've got to cherish, and it's what the, the European Union is wiping out. You know, I'll tell you what, if you want to come and see, I'll take you there. I'd love to come to the European Union. Come and see the heart oh. of the beast. When are we going? We'll go in a couple of days' time. That sounds great. Okay. okay. You see what you find when you come to Europe or the UK? You never know what you're going to run into or where you're going to go, but you're definitely going to have a great time.